All right, let's go. Greetings, Team Ajulam. Karibuni sana tena. We are now on our second episode of a series that we started called Faith Lifestyle, right? And the whole thing about this whole faith lifestyle is about us being able to cultivate a lifestyle of faith, right? The just shall live by faith. Amen. Jesus teaches us in Matthew 17, 14 to 20 that we do not have an issue of the amount of faith, but instead in the quality of our faith. That is the issue. And so the whole point about this series is this, that I want us to be able to have the kind of faith that Jesus wants us to have in him. The mountain moving faith, right? The book of Hebrews tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so faith pleases God. This is the life that pleases God. And so the purpose of this series, like I mentioned, is for us to cultivate a lifestyle of faith, to live a life that pleases God. Amen? Amen and amen. Now in this episode, I want us to again look at the story we studied last week, but from a different perspective. Now the story that we studied last week, we looked at the woman with the issue of blood. But this, 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 this time around, I want us to instead to look at another character in this story, which is Jairus. And this is such a beautiful story because it's so potent in that in the story of Jairus and in the story of the woman with the issue of blood, that these two stories teach us about faith. And so allow me to read from Mark 5, from verse 21 to 43. All right, let us read. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Amen and amen. This is the word of the Lord. So, last week what we did is that we focused on the story of the woman with the issue of blood. But today I want us to focus on the synagogue leader, Jairus, whose daughter was in need of healing. Now, like I mentioned last week, there was a huge, huge crowd that had come to see Jesus as, as soon as he landed um, uh, after coming from across the lake. And Jairus, who was a synagogue leader, came to plead with Jesus to come with him so that he could go heal his daughter. And now, from his words and his pleading, Jairus' faith, you know, had the faith that Jesus was able to heal his daughter. He literally says to Jesus, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Jairus is convinced that Jesus is able to heal his daughter. So Jesus agrees to go with him. And I can imagine at this point for Jairus, he must have been so glad in his heart that Jesus is coming with him. Because this is like, man, if he's coming with me and I know that if he lays his hands on my daughter, she will be healed and she will live. Right? Because he has the power to heal his ailing daughter. And I can imagine the hope and excitement he must have been feeling as, you know, Jesus is there. We're walking together to this house. Right? 
his prayers as good at, as good as answered you know like man we're already headed to the how my daughter is there this guy is going to put his hands on her and she's going to be healed now the thing is is that at this point when jesus is there walking towards jairus's house there's a lot of people around jesus following him probably just there just as bystanders to witness this miracle right just some two randoms <laughs> two randoms just there just so hype about all these things that jesus is doing and ready to go and see what it is that he'll be doing Right? And what we saw from last week is that while Jesus is on his way to Jairus' house, there was a woman who had an issue, uh, who had been sick for 12 years, right? She was 12 years a slave, who touched Jesus and got her healing, right? And many people at that point in time were pressing against Jesus, but because of this woman's faith, and on account of her faith, he was able to draw her miracle from Jesus. If you haven't watched that episode, you need to go watch it, by the way. Right? You need to go watch that first episode that we did um, on, on, on uh, Lego. <laughs> right? Now, while Jesus was speaking with this woman who he has healed, some people come from Jairus' house and they come to tell Jairus, your daughter is dead. So there's no need to bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter is de- she's dead. She's gone. No need to bother him. And when Jesus heard what had been told to Jairus, he says to him, don't be afraid. Just believe. Now, again, like I always like to do is to go into like the Greek words for things, right? I'm always just curious what this means. And so, if you look at the Greek word here that's used for the word afraid, it's the word phobeo. It's the word phobeo, which I'm sure is the word that comes from phobia, I'm sure, right? Phobeo. And what this word means is to flee, to be struck with fear, to hesitate to do something, Right? And the word here for believe, so remember that Jesus says to him, do not be afraid, just believe. The word here for believe is the Greek word pistuo. Pistuo. What this word means is to place confidence in. Right? And so what Jesus is basically saying to this, to Jairus is, is that, may I, don't hesitate. Let's not stop walking to your house. Don't hesitate. Keep your confidence in me. Keep your confidence in what it is that you have believed that I will lay hands on your daughter. She will be healed and live, which is what you said in the first place, that come place your hands on my daughter so that she may be healed and live. And so what Jesus is telling Jairus is that he should maintain this confidence that he has in Jesus, in what he believed about Jesus, that he would put his hands on her and that she would be healed and live. Maintain that confidence. Do not hesitate. Do not hesitate. Do not be struck with fear. Do not flee. Let us not stop walking towards your house. Let's keep going. That though he had received some negative news, that they should keep walking. And that he should keep his confidence in Jesus Christ, whom he believed would be able to heal his daughter. And at this point, what Jesus does is that Jesus at this point When this negative news comes to Jairus and he tells him, my guy, don't doubt, believe. He tells him basically, let's not hesitate, let's not stop here, let's keep going. Right? Don't follow the advice, don't bother me anymore. No, 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 let's keep going. Don't hesitate, let's keep going. Keep your confidence in what you believed, that I can heal this girl. Keep your confidence. And what Jesus does is at this point he refuses anyone else in the large crowd to continue on the journey with them. Except Peter James, John, and Jairus. So basically, he moves the whole crowd away and he's like, I only want these four people with me. And so they get to Jairus' house and there was a crowd there as well. He finds a commotion with people crying, wailing loudly because the girl has died. Okay? So Jesus seeing all this says to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. Again, just like it was earlier, Jesus gets everyone out of the house and he takes the child's parents, the disciples, Peter, James, and John, and goes to where the child is. And just like Jairus has believed, he put his hand on the girl and says to her, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. Right? Man, cool story, bro. Cool story, cool story, cool story. So the question is, what can we learn from this story about faith? Today, the question I want to ask you is, who are you listening to? In this story, Jairus...
is in need of a miracle and encounters Jesus. He has the conviction that Jesus is able to heal his daughter, right? And at this point, his daughter is sick. She isn't dead, okay? She isn't dead yet. She's sick. He receives some negative news and Jesus tells him, my guy, just ignore the news. Keep your confidence in me. Keep your confidence in me. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus does at this point. Is that even after, immediately after he tells him, my guy, maintain your, maintain your focus. Keep your confidence in me, right? Don't hesitate. Let's keep going. Let's keep going to your house, bro. We're not going to stop here. Let's keep going to your house. And keep your confidence in me in what it is that you have believed that I'm able to do. What he does, he, he does is that he gets rid of the crowd before they move forward. I want to put it to you today that for many of us, the reason why we have no faith is because of who we are around and who we choose to listen to. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you are believing God for something and then someone comes and tells you something that completely dampens your faith. I remember some time back, um, not even too long ago, I was scheduled you know, for this a very important meeting with this important person, right? The kind of person who, you know, the guy who just want can change everything, right? Uh, and so I was so certain that it is the Lord who has set up this meeting just because of how the whole meeting was structured. I was like, this is, this is God, this is God, this is so amazing, right? And I, you know, I was super excited and, and, and I, I could not wait to see what it is that God would work out because I'm just like, we're here to, we're going to go and be in the presence of a king. And I'm so excited because they're here to hear ideas. Like, this is super dope. Now, in the lead up to this meeting, I meet this guy who used to work for, for this person that I'm going to meet. And I told him that I'll be soon meeting the boss, but their former boss, and I was going to pitch X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. And this person was like super, super negative about it, right? They were like, oh, I don't know if that guy, you know that guy the way he is, uh, you, I don't think he'd like an idea like that. Da, 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 da. He's more interested in things like this, nini, what, all that stuff. And the thing that happened is that as a result, so forget about all the stuff that I had believed in the beginning. In fact, the fact that even this meeting had been set up, it was such a divine structure of how even this, the meeting happened. Or rather, the meeting that was going to happen had even been structured. But because of this person, all of a sudden, I lost confidence in that meeting. I began to be doubtful of what it is that we were looking to present. And in fact, in my head, I'm just like, I think we need to change everything that we're doing. Like... And all of a sudden, I began to realize that I was no longer excited for this meeting. I was, my, 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 my whole kind of faith was dampened about, about this meeting, right? And the only reason why this happened is I completely forgot about what it is that the Lord had revealed to me in the very beginning. And I began to then internalize these negative words that this person had spoken in regards to this meeting that still hasn't even yet happened. And my attitude completely changed. And it's so interesting because the meeting hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen at the end of this month. But the thing that's so interesting for me was, is that as I was preparing this message, that's when I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, I literally internalized this person, person's words. And I was now had reached a state of what it is that is the word uh, for, for, for bail where I began to hesitate to do this thing, where I began to hesitate about, like, should we even meet to, to discuss this thing, right? This meeting that we have, because it's just like, oh, I don't know if this thing is going to work anyway. This thing hasn't even happened yet, but already I'm in that place where, the, the, like Jairus, where someone has come and they're like, Man, I don't even bother Jesus. Your daughter is dead. Don't even bother Jesus, right? And so you always, at that point in time, those negative words dampened and brought hesitation. Yet God in the first place had shown me that this was a divine meeting that he had put together. Are you guys with me? Has God given you an idea, a word, a project to work on? And when you share it with some people, it causes you to hesitate from doing it because of their negativity? Or, or, or they altogether cause you to throw the idea away? When Jairus received the news of his daughter's death, Jesus says to him, he says to him, don't hesitate, let's keep going. The news he received, they received actually means that it had caused him to hesitate because I'm sure now he's this, he was going to take the advice of those guys to be like, 
I guess maybe there's no reason for me to go to continue going with Jesus. And imagine if he had made that decision. His daughter would have died. Literally would have just and just continue mourning. But because Jesus is telling him, do not hesitate. Do not let the fear come into your heart. Don't hesitate. Stick to what it is that you believed in the first place. And let's keep going. Let's keep going. And so the thing is this, this news that he received caused him to hesitate. It caused him to reconsider what he was believing for. And what does Jesus do thereafter? Look at what Jesus does. What Jesus does before they move any further is that he removes everyone around who had no faith and ensured that the only people that would continue on the journey would be those who believe. He literally refused anyone else to follow him except Peter, James, John, and Jairus. And I want to suggest to you today that the reason why you lack faith is is because of the people around you, because of the people that you choose to listen to. And so the question is that I want to ask you, as a person who wants to live a lifestyle of faith, who are the people that you're spending time with? Do they build your faith or do they destroy it? Are you expecting to be a person of faith but surrounding yourself with negative people? People making you hesitate in doing what it is that God is calling you to do. People who are telling you that the dreams that God has given you are too lofty. Tone it down. What would make you think that you can do such a thing? What makes you think that you can achieve such a thing? The let's be a listic crew. The, the, or, or the let me play the devil's advocate crew. Which first and foremost puzzles me. Like, my guy, why do you want to be uh, the devil's advocate? I mean, isn't he the guy we're trying to avoid here? Like, why are you here? You're signing up to be his advocate. Anyway, that's... But the thing is, my friend, is that if these are the people that you are constantly around, you will have no faith. Jesus was intentional in saying, all of you bounce. And the thing that's so interesting is that this isn't just in regards to people that you're physically around. If, for example, you spend all your time on social media, especially on platforms like Twitter, where all day, every day, all people do is complain and grumble. Like just the other day, I remember when we were uh, on Twitter, this uh, guy who people discovered is a scam artist, has been scamming all these um, um, uh, charitable causes and he's been scamming people right and so now what happens is is because now everyone has thrown a fit about it which is unfortunate yes now guys are like you need to be more careful about how you give you need to be more careful and so what happens is is that now all of a sudden because of what it is that you have seen because of this one guy you've decided everyone is a scam artist in fact there's no need to be giving you need to do you know be better about so it begins to make your heart hard about giving because of what it is that you've seen on social media. There are so many times for myself where I'll be on social media and I'll be like, what, what's this vibe I have? I just feel like a negative vibe. It's because if you spend time on these platforms, you lose your faith. Or if you spend your day watching news, which is mostly built around sharing with you all the negative things happening around the world. Or if you spend time, all your time watching reality TV shows, which are literally built for drama, where people are constantly beefing with one another, gossiping with one another, doing all these things with with, with each other. If these are the things that you surround your life with, you will inevitably become a negative, faithless person. Of course you will be filled with doubts, fears, and hesitations. And hesitations in the sense that God will be like, go give to this person, and you'll you'll be like, "Ah, remember that guy from Twitter? The way he has been scamming, maybe this person is scamming. Do you get what I'm saying? Of course you'll be filled with doubts, fears, and hesitations. Of course it will influence how you see the world and reduce your optimism for what is possible. And undoubtedly, these things will hinder your ability to believe. I can't tell you how many times I'll be having a great day and log into some platform and I'll just be like, it's like you just feel weird vibes. And so the question is, is who are you listening to? Who are you consistently surrounding yourself with? What things are you surrounding yourself with that are literally hindering you from living a life of faith? The Bible says in Romans 10, 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What are you hearing? 
What are you paying attention to? What are you giving your attention to that is around you? Because if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, what do you think doubts come by? It comes by hearing and hearing by the word of all the negative things, the negative people that you continually allow into your ear, that you are continually surrounded by. And let me go a little bit deeper on this. Woo! Gotta go deeper on this. When Jesus gets to the house and finds a commotion, what happens? He says to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And what did they do after he said this? It says that they laughed at him. I want to suggest to you that there are people around you that if you told them your dreams and what you're believing God for, they will laugh at you. They will ridicule you. I have friends who laugh at my dreams. I have friends who laugh at my ambitions. I personally genuinely believe that all things are possible and it is because of this belief that I never imagined that anything is out of the reach of God because it's like I serve a God for whom nothing is impossible. But there are people who will laugh at you because of this. The things you say will sound ridiculous to them because they have no faith. And notice what Jesus does yet again. Before healing the girl, he ensures that everyone except Peter, James, John, and the girl's parents are in the room. He makes sure that all those faithless people are removed from his presence. And so my point to you is this, is that if you are looking to live a lifestyle of faith, you need to stop hanging out with negative people if you're looking to live a life of faith. Or you need to, spend, you need to stop spending your time consuming negative content. If you keep the company of negative people or you are constantly consuming negative content, you will find very great difficulty in believing God for great things. And you have to do like Jesus did. You have to remove these things. You have to remove these people from your presence because your faith depends on it. And the other thing is, is that you have to stop sharing your dreams and visions with just anyone. There are people who will laugh and ridicule your dreams and visions. You have to deny these people the knowledge of your ambitions. Some people are the killers of your faith. <laughs> and this is what Jesus is here. When we look at this story, we realize. that. And the thing is, is that my point is that you can't avoid meeting or interacting with negative people if you live in this world. My point is, is who you choose to spend your time with who you choose to keep company with. That is the whole point here that I'm trying to relate to you. And you know the thing that is so unfortunate? Sometimes the killers of our faith oftentimes can be those who are closest to us. I believe that it is no coincidence that in the very next chapter of this story in, 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 in Mark 5, in Mark chapter 6, we are told this story that Jesus left there this is a story from verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many, of, many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles that he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Son? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, amongst his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Jesus could not perform any miracles in his hometown because they saw him as just another Kagai. This Kagai over here, the one who used to, ah, this Kagai. There are some times where those who are closest to you are the ones dampening your faith. And it's unfortunate. You know, I was just sharing with um, the Adulam team here how one of the things that I deeply appreciate, my parents listen to Adulam, so I'm here to also appreciate you, my parents, is that though they have been, they have God-given authority over me as my parents, you know, I'm supposed to honor them and, and, and honor your parents. The thing that I love about my parents is that they've never failed, even as their last born, to recognize the gift that God has given me. 
they literally practice what I preach. Yeah? They could easily look at what I do and be like, oh, I can last board, he's just here preaching, but you know, the, the, completely not recognizing the gift that God has given me. But instead, what they do is that they honor the gift that God has given me, which is something that to me is constantly so amazing, right? Is because for them, they revere God's word. They revere God, right? And so it doesn't matter what vessel is coming to deliver this word, right? Ah, which is so amazing. So I appreciate you, my parents, right? But the thing is, is that you'll find that there are many people who would possibly be close to you who necessarily would not appreciate the gifts that God has given you or the things that God is wanting to do in your life. And they will ridicule you and they will laugh at your dreams and they will laugh at their ambitions, right? And the thing that I love and I'm so grateful for is that I'm really grateful that for the most part, and this is something that I, that I think is such a, a huge privilege, but I think it's, it's because of that thing of just being in God's presence and, and, and being someone that is in pursuit of God, that my general vibes doesn't, generally doesn't allow me to tolerate being around negative people, right? For the most part, I'm always around the likes of Peter, James, and John, right? People with positive vibes, right? Where there's, you know, there's obviously been a number of times where like just recently where I was almost led into a space of neg negativity regarding, a, you know, this blessing of this meeting that God has, has organized and, 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 and almost getting into that place of negativity. But for the most part, the people that I generally keep company with, for the most part, are people who are like very positive, good energy, good vibes, right? And so naturally, like, you know, my faith in a ikonaka fuel in as and the layer, you know, just to keep pumping and keep going, right? But the thing is, like in that situation, I had to do what Jarius, what, what Jesus did with Jarius, where I, when I began to hesitate and be in fear, I had to be able to completely ignore the words that that person had spoken over me, right? And there's some times where I haven't been so diligent because many times I'm often sharing my dreams with just anyone and my visions with just anyone. Right? I'd be handing, what this, the Bible says, handing your pearls to pigs. <laughs> right? But the thing is, is that I'm so thankful that it doesn't necessarily affect me that when people laugh at, the, at, at my dreams and my visions. But the reality is that maybe one day it will hinder me from pursuing something that God is calling me to pursue. Right? Now the thing that Jesus teaches us from this story is that we need to be intentional about removing people from your life, from, your, from our lives, who only feed us negative energy. It is impossible to avoid encountering negative people, right? But the thing is here is that if it's within your power, do not allow yourself to regularly keep the company of negative, doubtful people. Jesus was intentional about who he kept company with. He was intentional and you need to do the same for the sake of your faith. You need to do the same for the sake of your faith. And the thing that Jesus also teaches us is that it's not with everyone for whom you can share your grand visions and plans that God has put on your heart. Don't give your pearls to pigs. And again, you need to be intentional with the people you share your dreams and visions with for the sake of your faith. Remember the story of Joseph, how he goes to his brothers, people who hate him to go and share his dreams. And look what happened to him. <laughs> Get ended up in a pit. <laughs> right? Um, and that's the whole thing, right? Is that if mountain moving faith is going to be nurtured in you, if you are going to be able to live a lifestyle of faith, you're not going to be able to do this if the people that you intentionally keep company with are people who are negative, doubtful, faithless people. Because that will hinder your faith and will hinder your ability to live a lifestyle of faith. Amen? And so do what Jesus did. Be intentional about removing these people. But even in the same thing, it's not just, like I said, physical people, but intentional about removing even in terms of how much time you spend on, on things that literally are feeding you negative energy, giving you doubtful energy, things that will make you question, things that even make you feel like, my guy, like, you know, there's sometimes where you go on Twitter and you'll just start to hate your country. You'll be like, man, I hate Kenya. I hate this country. I hate this. I hate it. I hate it. You know, and it's just like, 
May I, do you know there are some people who come, they literally travel to this country because they're just like, this is the land of my dreams, right? I don't know if any of you have ever traveled, and I know this is not, a, I, I'm sure we have, we have our challenges, yes. But for the most part, it's not, it's not everywhere that it's just doom and gloom. There are many times where I've traveled to other African countries, and literally, like, I'm just like, I can't wait to go back home. Like, I can't wait to go back home, because it's just like, it's so much better. And, but the thing is, is that if you are constantly in a space of just pure negativity, of course you're going to end up starting to hate even the things around you and have no hope, no faith, no ambition around anything because of all the negative vibes that you have just completely surrounded yourself with, whether it's people, whether it's just like the things that you choose to see and listen to, the things that you're watching, whatever it is. And so do the thing that Jesus did, which was the intentionality of removing these things so that faith may continue to live inside of you. Amen? Amen. Go find your Peter, James, and John, the peeps that you can hang out with who constantly fuel and feed your faith. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Father, for this word. Um, Lord, I pray in Jesus' holy name that you would help each and every single one of us to be able to be conscious of the people that we choose to surround ourselves with. I pray, Father, that you'd give us the ability to be intentional, Holy Father, in being able to mute out all the things that bring negativity into our lives, that we may be able to live a life of faith, a life where it is that where we are able to believe you for the things that you have said that we are able to do. And so, Father, I pray that even as we cultivate this lifestyle of faith, that you give us the courage to be able to shed off anything that is hindering us from being able to walk in this life of faith. We thank you, we honor you, and we magnify your holy name. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Listen, if this message blessed you, please be sure to share it with someone whom you love. Share it with a friend, a colleague, anyone. And then also, listen, support us. Support this ministry so that we can be able to make more dope content and be able to spread this message of the kingdom to as many people as possible. And then, make sure that you subscribe. Sawa, subscribe. Subscribe, wherever the button, subscribe, subscribe. God bless you guys. Thank you.